Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic podcast on Totem Pole Nation. We got Coach Kevin Saunders on again, my great friend from Southwest Virginia, and he's going to be coming on here today to talk about how to fix a struggling program. And I've been in some struggling programs, Coach, so this is something we could all use. And uh, just for anybody that doesn't know you, Coach, uh, tell them a little bit about yourself and you know, where all you been and what have you learned? <laughs> well, I've learned a lot, but I've been a head coach. Well, I've been a head coach for 30 years and an assistant for the past four years. I, you know, I wanted to get out and get in more into coaching. So you don't get to coach as much as a head coach like you do. I get to spend more time coaching and spend time with the players and building those relationships more so than as a head coach head coach you know it's a lot to be put on your plate and those things and in georgia uh it's it's a lot i was in virginia for a very long time and and was very successful and enjoyed that and uh but couldn't make any money i'm not gonna lie to you can't make any money unless you come to georgia and or go to texas South Carolina is paying now. I mean, you go work here in Virginia and you don't get to count your coaching supplements, which wasn't very much uh, towards your retirement. Yeah, that's pretty bad. So here in Georgia, you count everything you make towards your retirement. This will finish my 10th year in Georgia, which makes me vested. And I got a good gig going on as a defense coordinator here at Duluth, a 7A school. I was head coach at a 7A school here in Georgia and and a couple stops as a head coach here in Georgia. And now I'm enjoying being in the same county, Gwinnett, where I was as a head coach. So it's it's pretty good just moving around. Yeah, MK, this is my great friend, Coach Saunders from Virginia. He's coaching down in Georgia. He's going to be talking to us today about how to fix a struggling program. Coach, I'm going to present your screen. Coach has got a okay. presentation for us today. You and got I'm it. added on there, Coach, fixing a struggling program. That's me. Uh, I've taken over a lot of programs. If you go to the next slide, that way they can get an idea of who I am and what I've done. Yeah, you can control it, Coach. You got it. All right, that sounds good. Uh, I was a head coach, like I said, in Virginia and won a state championship, played for one. I don't know how many times I've been coached a year, but I have a reputation of taking over really bad programs and turning them around. And i give you an example. My first head coaching job that I took over there at William Campbell in Virginia. They were one and nine and got beat 88 to nothing against Jefferson Forest when Anthony mm. and Dexter and them were playing the year before I got there. Then the first year we end up, uh, Jefferson Forest has to score in the fourth quarter to beat us. And then we go on in history after that. And then, J.J. Kelly in Southwest Virginia was four and 36 before I got there. First year, we were six and four, uh, beat J.I. Burton, which was huge. It's like Auburn. It's like Auburn beating Alabama. And we made playoffs every year after that that I was there. We upset Powell Valley, uh, had the state's longest winning streak at that time there. And then we turned that program around. And then I go from there to a couple other stops and do the same thing. And then I was fortunate enough to take over a program that didn't need rebuilding, and that was Gretna. And they'd won four state championships before I got there. My first year, we lose in the state championship. And then the next year, we win the state championship and took over a program that needed to be learn how to keep going with what they did. And uh, while I was there, we were always in the playoffs, had great teams, had great coaches and that thing. And to build these programs, I've taken stuff from a lot of coaches. I think if you've been coaching a long time, you, you become a great thief. And I don't think very many, you know, coaches come up with some ideas on their own, but they also take stuff from other coaches. And uh, I've done this and this presentation I got is a lot of stuff that I've taken from other coaches and discussed with coaches in the past and the coaches I've worked with about putting this together. And I spoke at uh, Lutz's uh, clinic up in William Byrd on this. I love going to that clinic. Gives me a chance to come back to go to see some guys in Virginia. I think, you know, 
I've had chances to speak at the Glacier and those time of those big clinics. And I just think sometimes you're better off going to a smaller clinic or going off and just meeting with the coaches one-on-one -on -one because the majority of the coaches that you see at these Glacier clinics have dudes and it doesn't matter what you do. And the dudes are going to win. You could be the worst coach in the world and win five or six state championships and don't even know how to play cover three. And, you know, I've seen that in my time and that just is the way it goes. So the first thing you got to do, I truly believe you got to focus on five things. And a lot of this has come from different things that I've learned from other coaches and things that have helped me. Uh, Chris Parker is one of the best I've ever been around to put stuff in writing and books and stuff. And he's now assistant superintendent here. He was a uh, coach with Sid Maxwell. If anybody knows who Sid is, he was, um, from Southwest Virginia played at Richlands and he's been here in Georgia and he's been, he's been an incredible football coach. Him and Jeff Aaron are from Virginia. Jeff just uh, retired. He'd just taken Camden back to the state championship, still running the wing tee and under center and took on the state championship again. And he's just, he, he's a ball coach. And those two guys are some of the best. Chris Parker's good. I truly believe it's, you know, you, your scheme depends on what you got and who you have, but you got to build relationships. And that's number one. Next is you got current, you got to have, you know, you got to have concentrate on what you do have, not what you don't have. I think that's one of the things people don't understand. If you've got a quarterback then you got to use it. If you don't have a quarterback, it's hard to throw the ball all the time. <laughs> and, you know, you got to focus on the present. You got to focus on no matter what they've done in the past, it's over. And, you know, and I've been one of these after we won the state championship there at Gretna, we didn't talk about the team from the year before we'd already known we'd won one. So now all we do is worry about the present. Also, when I took over a program like it, uh, JJ Kelly and wise, or one of those teams that were really bad before I got there, they knew they were bad. They didn't need me to come in there and tell them that they played bad. Hey, so, you know, I didn't, that's, what I'm not going to do. I'm going to concentrate on what we got there. And you got to have rules for the new program. And that's the only ones that you can enforce. And as a head coach, I never wrote down rules. And I'll tell you why. I, one time, you know, I was always, well, if you miss practice, you know, you can't play. Well, there's always that circumstance that, and yeah, thumbs up that you don't know. So I quit putting rules in writing pretty much. The rules I put in writing are very easy to keep. Uh, they're very vague. So you can interpret them because every kid has a situation and you as a coach has to have to understand that situation. I've had kids that have been in jail. I've had kids that have had to go to the birth of their kid and mispractice. I've had kids that, you know, have to go on vacation with their father or mother because they have they're in a divorced family. There's all sorts of things that can go on. And the more you rules you put down, the worse worse shape you are. I know some coaches don't believe in that, but I just do because I truly believe as a coach, we are supposed to be here for these kids. It's not, you know, well, I cut that kid off the team. Well, good for you. To me, you need to figure out how to keep him on your team. And that's because they need us more than we need them. Mm. So and that, and then you got to have a plan. And the first thing is about relationships and what a like relationships mean. Those kids need to know that you care for them. It's not just the kids. It's about everybody that's involved with the program from stakeholders, booster club, administration, band, cheerleaders, everything. And the other thing is you, you got to be genuine. And by that, I mean, I was told a long time ago by a coach, I heard speak at a coaching clinic, uh, Coach Ragsdale at Giles. You can't mm. BS. You can't BS a kid. They can yep. see through it quicker than anybody in the world. And you gotta get to know these kids. And then, and when I take over a program, the first thing I do is I bring every kid in and sit down and talk to them individually about what do you want out of this program. What can you contribute to this program? What were some of the negatives of this program? And what were some of the positives of the program before we got here? So let them know that. And you got to be honest and you got to be respectful to these kids and to the people in the thing. Uh, and then you got to build the adult relationships. And that is with the parents. And the parents need to know you're going to take care of their kids. And they need to know, the administrators need to know 
if my dog pops up on here, don't worry about it. He he wants to he wants to talk also. He thinks he's a coach also. Look at that little guy, man. Yep. He yeah, he wants to be a coach. Uh, and you got to have relationships with the adults, the parents, the administrators, <laughs> the stakeholders, the faculty. The old regime is what people don't understand. That you, you, I've taken over where I've had to keep every coach on staff from the previous staff. And mm -hmm. you got to build that relationship with them. And it's yeah. hard. You know, I've never been around a coach, and a coach that tries to screw it up on purpose. I, you know, I don't believe that. And the other thing is you got to get along with the other sports. And, and there are these coaches that don't believe kids should play other sports. I'm the opposite. I think they should play as many sports as they can. Because truthfully, our kids are kids. What we're coaching in high school are kids. I didn't go out and recruit them, which a lot of people in high school do now, is they recruit these kids to come play for them. Which, if you recruit them, you recruit them. But then you still got to take care of them, man. You got to do the things right by the kids. And that's so important. And you got to take care of the other sports. I truly believe that the only way you're going to survive at a school is take care of the other sports. Uh, I really enjoyed my time at Pebble Brook. Uh, it was right outside Atlanta at Six Flags. It, you know, it could be a little rough, but the community and the administration there and the teachers were incredible. And the students, I love that place. And the basketball coach, George Washington, did an incredible job with the basketball team. He had Colin Sexton that was, you know, a first round draft pick, went to Alabama and played in the NBA. And he helped me with football so much by getting me kids that, that just thought they were basketball players. And he told them, said, dude, you're not going to play. So you need to, there's only five that can come out here. And he helped me get a bunch of kids out for football. And that's one of the things I truly respect about what he did in there at Pellbrook. Mm. And the things you got to remember about this when you're in adult relationships is everybody's in this together. And in public, you need to discuss and praise the administration, the teachers, everybody positively in the public. And I think that's very important. I don't think everybody does that. And then when you take over a new program, you need to look from their point of view. And, and that's it's hard to do. But if I was a coach that was on a previous staff that they say they went 0-10 and, and bring in a new coach, I don't believe that guy coached that team to be 0-10. I just don't. It's kind of like practicing the fumble play. You know, everybody in the stands, oh, why'd you run that play? Well, we practice the fumble play about 100 times in practice just so we can run it in a game. You know, it goes back to that. The kids don't try to fumble on purpose. The coach didn't call the fumble play. And not everybody's going to agree with everything. That's what's great about this country and stuff. You can have your own viewpoint of what things are going on. Co concentrate on what you have, not what you don't have. I think this is what coaches tend to do. They get in a little pissing contest about, well, I don't have a blaster. I don't have a field house. <laughs> got five coaches. My weight room's small. I don't have this. I don't have that. Dude, all you do is got problems. And my whole thing that I've always believed is there's no such thing as a problem, just solutions. You mm -hmm. can sit here and tell me, I've seen, I'll tell you this, Cedar Grove down here in Georgia has got one of the best two, three, eight football programs anywhere. And they win the state championship about every year. Their facilities can are awful. They don't have a locker room. They don't have a field house. They, their weight room's tiny. And wow. they just go out there and play ball. And they play ball. And they're, they usually, their non-region schedule is usually out of state in Texas and Florida and 7A schools because nobody will play them in 2 and 3A. They have dudes, no doubt. But they could sit there and complain about what they don't have. And those kids play with that chip on the shoulder. Same thing when I was at Pebble Brook, we did we had two bathrooms in a locker room for a hundred kids, just two toilets. But you either got you got to make do so you can play with it as a chip on your shoulder, or you can or you can sit there and whine and cry about it and use it as an excuse. And you got to avoid petty problems. Petty problems are like just like I said, oh, our our field's not lined. We only got a forty yard field. We don't have an indoor facility. We don't do this. Quit complaining and quit complaining and just have and get your solutions. And the other thing is you got to have attitude and effort. You got to give great effort and practice. You got to have great attitude. You got to enjoy what you got. And like I said, it's not about the past. Don't worry about what was done last year. You were 0 10 last year, but this year you're 
10 and 0, 0 and 0. You start that way. You can't change the past. All it, all it will do is tear down relationships. If you badmouth the staff, you badmouth the players before you, it does nothing but tear down what you've got going on. You, there's no reason to make an enemy for no reason. My thing is you take over and they tell you, oh, that wrestling coach, he won't let those kids play football. And so, you know, going in there, you think he's an enemy. Well, you don't know that. That's what he's done in the past. Whatever it is, I don't know. But you got to go in there and say, hey, let's work together on this. And he probably will. I've never known a kid, coach, very few coaches that I've worked with in my 30 years as a head coach that ever told a kid not to do something. And I will tell you, one of the smartest ones I heard was uh, – Colin Sexton one time and, and a few other kids on the basketball team wanted to play seven on seven. And truthfully, we told them no, because they were that good of basketball players. And I do think at times when I was at Shelby Valley in Kentucky, uh, we had Mr. Basketball as, you know, was on, uh, there at the school and they'd won the state championship in Kentucky in basketball, which is hard to do because there's only one state champion in Kentucky in basketball, but our school run, won it. And, I had the brother playing on the team and his brother was a big time athlete and I wanted him out football, but smart that I am, he didn't need to be, he was going, his future was in basketball and he was going to have a paycheck in basketball and I couldn't compete with that. And I didn't want to compete with that. So, but my ability to work with the basketball coach helped us know that that kid wasn't shouldn't be playing because he could have, he could have got hurt and ruined his career, but we did get other basketball players out there playing and they helped us. So that's why you got to work with your coaches and the other sports rules you can enforce. I tell you right now, I think this is the only thing, you know, don't assume that they did not do the, I always hear this. Well, this team before us did not do the little things. Well, how, you know, man, I don't know coaches don't try to do the little things and they get fired and you know, it just doesn't work out. Wasn't a good fit or something. It's not from lack of effort of the head coach or that. And don't think just working harder is the answer to everything. That's not, that's not the answer to changing a program. People think, oh, all we got to do is work harder in the staff here in front of us. Well, what makes you think they didn't work hard? You know, so I never did figure that one out. I didn't think anything about it because I believe all coaches do the same thing. It's just like me thinking that all teachers, I haven't met a teacher that wants to fail a kid that goes, I'm going to school today and I can't wait to fail little Johnny on a test today. I've been looking forward to this all day. There are no teachers like that. They can sit there and say that there are, there are not. So you can't have that around and you can't have people thinking about that. So, and then then focus on one or two things to enforce. And the easiest thing is two rules on the field off the field, be where you're supposed to be and do right. Just tell them do right. That covers everything. Two rules on the field, have great effort, be coachable. The rest of it will take care of itself. I know sometimes kids say bad words. Sometimes coaches say bad words. You can dress it real quick and go on. No big deal. We're going on about it. Uh, kids have bad days too. Some kids didn't sleep last night because they had work. You know, so they had to work all day, all night. So they come to school, fall asleep in the class. And the first thing the teacher do, does is tell you, well, you're a football player sleeping in my class. Well, did you ask him why he was sleeping in your class? You know, maybe there's a reason. And that goes back to building those relationships. He might have had to work all night. Maybe he had to sleep in his car. Maybe he didn't have anywhere to be. Maybe he stayed at a friend's house because he doesn't have a home. Mm. But you need to know those things. And all that stuff happens. And where the people know it, those things are really happening today in today's programs. And then enforce the rules. Have common sense. Don't get on a kid for doing something they didn't do on purpose. Like my thing is about fumbling. That kid really fumbled on purpose. You know, I get on kids as hard as anybody. But I don't get on them for things that they didn't do on purpose. I'll get on them for doing things that they're coached to do and they continue to do it wrong. So my thing is, I always tell, and I do, I always tell them every day that I love them and I get on my players hard, but they also will know how much I care for them by, by the end of the day. That's why I've always got along with my players. That's why most players will tell you I'm a player's coach. And it goes back to building those relationships with those kids and everybody around. You got to do that and you got to have a plan. And I truly believe you have to say it's our plan. And I'm going to tell you this, whether people want to say it or not, 
plans don't win games. Execution of the plan is what wins. You know, and here's the other thing. Players make plays, not coaches. So you as a coach have to do what's best for your football team. And, and I got to, and I truly believe you have to have everybody in that football program going the same way. It's like getting on a bus. Everybody has to be going in the same direction on that bus. Everybody has to know what's going on. You have to do that. Don't ask them to do things they can't do. And I think that's one of the things that most coaches, especially younger coaches nowadays, we're going to run the spread. Well, you go right ahead. Quarterback can't throw it 20 yards, but you would go ahead and run that spread. You got a five foot eight quarterback and six foot four offensive lineman. The spread is a great offense to run. Yes, sir. But then you got a six foot five, 210 pound quarterback can throw it all over the yard. Yeah, we're going to be under center handing the ball off every play. You know, that's things that coaches just don't understand. It's not about you, it's not about your ego. It's about what your kids can do. So don't ask them to do things that they can't do. Put them in a position for them to win. Find out what they do best and do it. I, I tell you this, when I was at Gretna, we didn't blitz a whole lot. Everybody thought we did, but we didn't. Just because of the way how fast we played on defense. We could fly to the football. We had dudes out there that could run. We had smaller dudes on the offensive defensive line when I was at William Campbell when you know you sat there and had all these people running wishbone and wing tee back in those days. We had smaller defensive linemen, but they could run. So we get we put them in position to make plays. And I truly believe you got to be different whether it's on offense, defense, or kicking game, you got to be different. you got to make a commitment to being different. I truly believe in analytics about going for it wherever it tells you to go for it, but you also got to have a feel for the game as a coach. I truly, one of the things that I learned more from basketball is watching how really good basketball coaches use the clock. There's ways to take time in a football game, hidden seconds that most coaches don't pay attention to. Run, they all run into the sideline to get the play. The throwing the ball to the wrong official when they're trying to mark it. Uh, getting up slow from a pile. You know, everybody says, well, in high school football, they got that 40 second or whatever. I tell them all the time, those referees don't do that. They don't know it. Don't worry about it. Most referees there have already worked nine to five. So they're not professional referees. So you need to learn how to control the clock of a game. You have to learn how to speed the game up, slow it down, change, do whatever. And that's why I think you need to be different and focus on those kind of things. You got to give every player on that team a chance to succeed. Be positive about them. And here's one thing I get about on with coaches a lot, these younger coaches, you got Teach the top position, the skill level. Don't hold the good ones back. Challenge the other ones, but don't coach down to them. All right? Maintain, maintain positive discipline. You can read that. Student and athletes expect and want discipline. I don't care what anybody says. If you discipline a kid and you take credit, you know, not credit, but if you take a vested interest into them, they will give you 150% effort. Make them understand that discipline is part of the 100% effort required to go the distance. Investment, church, family, classroom, homework, community, weight room, etc. Those are all things that go into being a great young man and a good football player. I always talk to them about doing the right things. You know, student players want teachers and coaches to believe in them, but they got to give them a reason to believe in them. And by that, they got to try to do right. And if they do right, the teachers and people will believe in them. And every person on that football team needs to feel a part of the football team. Somehow, some way, everybody can contribute. One thing I don't do, I don't put twos against ones in practice unless they're ready to do it. I will put ones against ones, twos against twos, threes against threes. I don't believe in putting somebody, uh, for example, I had Champ Thompson there at Meadow Creek, who, who's now at Clemson as a defensive lineman. Why would I want to put a freshman offensive lineman across from him unless that freshman was good enough to go across from him? Majority of them aren't. So why am I at that? All that does is give Champ bad habits and also makes the kid that's blocking him feel like he can't do anything. So my job is to make him feel part of the team. My That's part of coaching. 
You know, Coach Beamer told me a long time ago, you take a kid out there and if he played in high school and stood on his head and made every tackle and he gets up here and plays with us and you put him in a good stance and tell him what he's supposed to do and all that and he don't make any tackles, he said, I'm going to tell you what coaching is. You turn him around and tell him to stand on his head. He told me, he said, that's coaching. It's not all this other stuff. It's getting the kids to believe in what they can do and for them to be successful at how they're doing it. And the overall success of a team isn't win or losing. I've had some teams that I've been fortunate not having many losing seasons, but two of the best teams I ever had were five and five and six and four. They just did everything right. They played to their best ability because in high school football, usually the best X's will beat the best O's and the best or the worst O's. The best kids usually find a way to win and the most physical teams are going to win. I don't believe you can practice soft and expect to win games. You got to practice hard and you got to practice physical or else they're not going to be physical in a game. I truly believe in the reward system. I believe in giving kids everything you can think of. First guy down the field, make a tackle on a kickoff. He gets a milkshake, you know, whatever. And then you got to execute the plan no matter what, no matter what the hurdles are. And, and here's what people don't understand. The plan can change. You can change the plan. You can say, well, I was running the spread, but now I need to run the wishbone. Or I was a four-man front, but we're better in an even front. We uh, we got two platoon, but we can probably need to play kids both ways or vice versa. You need to understand that you can change your plan, and, but everybody has to be on the same page with that. And never quit on your vision. Always believe in it. And here's the thing, some things about being a winner that I truly believe. The only thing that tastes, acts, and feels like success is success. I don't care what anybody says. To achieve goals, you must be strong-minded, disciplined, and determined to do whatever is necessary to get the job done. And I truly believe that. Don't come in and say, well, if the ref hadn't have made that call, or my favorite thing is I love watching a kid, somebody throw a golf club playing golf. Do you think that golf club is what made the bad shot? You know, if you throw anybody, throw yourself down on the floor, throw yourself down on the ground. It's not that. So you got to make sure that you do things the correct way. Don't say things would have turned out better if the referees had done that. I don't believe in that. Never have. Winners consistently work harder than everyone else. They can try to tell me they don't, but winners are different than most people. They are committed to doing what's better. Uh, nobody, I didn't wake up to be average today. I didn't wake up to be mediocre is what I tell the kids all the time. I didn't. If you want to be mediocre, then you go somewhere else. And it's not about that. You know, it has nothing to do with being a tough guy or a nice guy. It's having everything to do with all the success, failures, and being an individual that's got great, well-grounded principles. And I think if we have that, those kids will understand that, and that will carry over to them. And that's what I've used in the past. It's kind of guided me to get these football programs turned around. And it's, I know it's, I stole a lot of stuff and used other people's language and, and that kind of thing, but truly that will help you with a football program. I, I think that you have to be committed to doing what's right and, and don't go in there and believe that, that what they did before you was wrong. That is one thing most coaches will tell you. Oh, I can't believe they did that. Well, mate, that's what they thought. That's what they believed. But it might not have been the right fit. So you as a coach got to see what the right fit is. So that is why I truly believe that, you know, there are two types of coaches. Coaches that have been fired and the coaches that will be fired. Mm -hmm. And that is just, and that's the way it is. If you stay in long enough, you will eventually get fired. I mean, you know, I hate to say it, look at the people were talking about firing Calipari at Kentucky. Well, he's been in a long time, but he wins 26, 27 games a year, but still not good enough. If you stay in it long enough, you'll eventually get fired. And, you know, and like the guy in Oakland up there this year, been there 40 years. He's been on the hot seat some like seven or eight times. And people don't realize that. And, you know, it's just things that, about coaching that a lot of people don't understand. And they think it's, what have you done for me lately? And they talk about how kids have changed. Well, they've changed because we've allowed them to change. Mm. 
we as parents have allowed that. And it's just, that is an issue. And they talk about old school coaching. Old school coaching is just coaching. You know, they can say all they want. And NIL money and those kind of things are something new coaches have to deal with. Even in high school, we have it down here in Georgia. We've got kids getting money right now to play at high schools. And it's just it's just nature's beast. It's how you deal with it and how you deal with and have a plan to deal with it. So everybody understands what's going on. I think the, one of the main failures of struggling programs is lack of communication. And the lack of communication between coaches, administrators, staff, and that regard. He wants you to pick him up, man. He wants me to be on the that. TV. He MK to wants to know it's over. What if a girl joins the football team? Is that allowed? Yeah, why? I've had, I mean, my daughter should have played. She would have been great. I never had a problem if a girl plays football. She's just got to do the same thing the guys do. Yeah. Just like, you know, a guy, then I don't think a guy can join the girls' basketball team. But if a girl wants to try to play football, then try to play. Yeah. I mean, it's just the way things are nowadays. Yeah. And I mean, there's always a role that the girl could do. I mean, yeah, my brothers or... had my brothers had a couple girls there at Bradford two or three times. Man, yeah. you know, and you just got to do. It's no problem, no problems, just solutions. Yeah, I totally agree. And I mean, anybody that watches your presentation in this podcast, I mean, not only are they getting information they can use to fix a struggling program, but this is something they could use when they go into a job interview oh, no because doubt. everything you're talking about is what they want to hear. So, I mean, you, you, do you agree with that coach? Oh, I think so. I think everything you do, I think everything to be successful in anything is you got to have relationships. I tell our kids all the time, you know, I don't want to go to college. Well, I don't go to college. You know, the world needs ditch diggers, but be the best ditch digger there is. There's nothing wrong with that. I just don't think as a, person that you want to endorse laziness and mediocrity and that kind of thing. I think if you want to be, you know, to work, you know, bagging groceries will be the best bagger there is. Why would you want to just be the average bagger? So those are things that I think we as, you know, as adults and teachers and mentors need to get through to our young people is you need to be the best you can be. And it doesn't always mean working harder. It means sacrificing and doing things that you might not want to do. And that's the difference between a winner and a loser is the winner is going to sacrifice and do what he has to do or she has to do to win. Yeah. So for the young coaches out there, we got a lot of guys that watch this. And a lot of them are new to the coaching profession. I mean, what advice would you give them as being a guy who is, I mean, you've been all around the state of Virginia. Now you're in Georgia. You've been a head coach for 30 years. You've been an assistant. Everybody wants to be the head coach. So what advice do you have to those guys that aspire to be the head coach or, you know, want to move up in the profession? Well, I'm going to tell you one thing is you need to spend some time with an older coach because every young coach comes in there. I want to be a coordinator. I don't want to coach eighth grade. I want to be a coordinator. Their first job, they want to be a coordinator. Uh, the other day I was on a coaching site. And somebody on there was a uh, coach was asking a head coach who just got a head coaching job was asking if anybody knew how to line a field. Unbelievable to me. I remember lining with chalk. Yeah. And lime. I take lime. I remember taking diesel and burning the grass. Ooh, you know, I like and, that. And those things. We used to do that. I mean, I've done everything known to man. Uh, I wash clothes. I get the younger coaches nowadays don't quite grasp that concept of that's what you're supposed to do. Instead of asking a coach what to do, you should do it. You should do it before you ask the head coach. If stuff's laying out in the equipment room, put it up. Don't go in there and ask what to do about it. Go do it and get it done. That's the difference in some of the younger coaches. And, and you get to all these younger coaches. Well, I got great ideas. Okay. I had an old, I had a coach tell me a long time ago, you know, coach, we can do this a lot better. 
And he said, really? He said, yeah, gave him the sheet of paper, gave the coach, I won't say the coach's name, but gave the coach the sheet of paper. And he said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put that in the U file. And the guy goes, what's the U file? And old coach goes, well, I'll tell you what the U file is. When you become a head coach, you can do that. <laughs> oh, and I'll never forget that. And, uh, you know, I've been around some guys, so that's just the way it was. And, you know, I remember having to go do things that, as an assistant coach and travel, swap films. I used to have to, you know, go all over the state to give films. I remember going and scouting games, uh, things that they don't do nowadays. But everybody's yeah. their first job, these guys think they want to be a coordinator. Yeah. Well, there's more to it than just calling plays, dude. You know, I truly believe coaching is more than X's and O's. It's about putting kids in the right spot and then building those relationships with the players. When I break down film, very seldom does it have to do with X's and O's. I want to see how hard they play first. If they play hard, we're going to have a tough game. Because if they're playing hard, they respect their coaches. And I got to tell you, the, one of the things that I find out that is difficult for younger coaches is they all think it's about the plays and about the flash and about the, the bling that goes with it. They just need to understand that coaching is making them successful. You don't put a square peg in a round hole. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I just think people think it's about plays. It's about the players, man. It's about the players. Give those kids a chance to be successful. They need the success and they need a structure of a football program so they can learn what discipline and hardship and failure is about. Because if you don't learn from failure, it's really poor. And you won't, you can't pick, if you can't pick yourself up off the ground, you, you're not going to be very good in this life. Yeah. Coach Bald wants to know, Coach Saunders, being in such an amazing football state like Georgia, Coach Ball's from Virginia. He lives down in St. Petersburg, Florida now. Who was the best single player you remember facing and why? Uh, Thomas Jones? I mean. I didn't coach against the Jones boys. They had already left when I got there. Um, I got to tell you, uh, Pew at Amherst that went on to play at Virginia Tech was incredible. Yeah, he was good. The tight end. Yeah, he played an offensive defensive line, and those linemen were the best. But I'll tell you, the best high school football player I ever saw was Allen Iverson. <laughs> Never came off the field. Never came off the field. Had big shoulder pads. I remember watching him up there at EC Glass in the state championship, and he won the game by himself. He returned kicks, returned <laughs> punts. He kicked off. He punted. He never came off the field. He played safety on defense and quarterback on offense. And he never came off the field. He's the best high school football player I'd ever seen. Man. And he was one of them. I coached another one, Elmer Holmes, in, in Northern Virginia, was also one of the best I'd ever seen. And he played for us. And then the kid I had this uh, two years at Pebble Brook was uh, – Trey Pinckney, who was uh, went to junior college at Hutchinson, was an All American there, and then became went to uh, Myrtle Beach and went to Coastal Carolina and did well. And now he's at um, he's finishing his college career at Southern Miss. He was one of the best. Now I did see, happen to see Trevor Lawrence play in high school. That was ridiculous. I mean, he threw the ball from one hash to the other at about 100 miles an hour. And you just, you don't, you know, you sit there and watch some of these guys play and you're just sitting there in awe of them. I mean, there's nothing you could do. Um, you know, it was Leon King at Giles County was incredible. I mean, I remember trying to play against him and he was just unbelievable. Just couldn't do nothing with him. I play, I coached against all the, uh, all the boys from GW Danville. Mm. Uh, and all they had the, a bunch. And all the kids from uh, Dan River that are all in the NFL now, all three brothers, you know. The Edmonds is. Yeah. And then I coached against them and was fortunate enough we beat them. Uh, 
Anthony Poindexter is probably the best I've ever coached against, I would have to say, at Jefferson Forest. I, I th sat there one time. He was making every tackle at the line of scrimmage playing safety. And I said, we're going to burn him right here. We're going to throw, we're going to run wagon and throw the backside post on him. Yeah, we did. We burned him all right. He intercepted it right now. He, he couldn't, he was the best. And then he turned around and ran quarterback in the wishbone, you know, mm. for Jefferson Forest. And that was the first time we played them when I was at William Campbell. And the only time we lost to them when I was at William Campbell was my first year. And we played them quite a few times, but Poindexter was probably the best I've coached against. Yeah, now he's a great coach at Penn State. And yeah, and I talk to him quite a bit every now and then. And then, you know, he's done a really good job. And the Edmonds brothers are class acts and uh, – you know, Virginia has been really good to me. Uh, I miss a lot of it. I don't miss the weather. I don't, I, I tell you, I just got to the point where the cold was just too much for me. And the other thing is it just really bothered me that coaches couldn't get paid what they deserve to get paid. And, uh, you know, that's just, but they expect you to work in the summer and they expect you to work 12 months out of the year and, and don't get paid for it. That's I mean, it, it, is there anything that, the coaches in Virginia can do, or is that more on a county basis, or is it? Well, one we thing is that's really good in Georgia is they have a teacher pay scale for the whole state. So you everybody makes the same. The only difference is it comes from the local supplement, is the county supplement, is what makes it a little bit different. Might only be a thousand dollars, might be two thousand dollars a year per teacher, but the state has the state of Georgia, like our governor come in and said, everybody got a $3,000 raise. So every teacher got $3,000 raise. I mean, everybody. And then local supplements, what the local government does. So the richer government, you know, richer counties can give a little bit more, but you're not finding that big a disparity between that. I mean, down here, you can make $25,000 as your coaching supplement. Just your coaching something, not including your teaching. Um, you wow. can get you can get on the state website and you can see every coach's salary. They post it. Now that's not including what the boosters give them, because boosters down here will pay. I mean, we're finding now that almost a lot of schools are all getting indoor facilities. Um, their weight rooms are incredible. The head coaches are getting paid astronomical amounts, but they also might get fired tomorrow. Then they treat it like a college. You, you don't keep your job down here if you lose. If you're losing, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, Willie Kiff is from Virginia, from Richmond. It's the state of Virginia help local governments, but the local governments dictate budgets and accept or reject what the school board gives them. Yep, he Coach knows all about that. He's been all around Virginia. Well, here's the other thing. Y'all – See, Georgia's big with the, uh, you know, lottery, right? Well, that lottery money in Georgia went straight to education. It didn't make the general fund. Lottery money in Georgia goes straight to education. Mm. No ifs, ands, or buts. That's what it was made for. And if you remember, when Virginia started there, as I was there, that money for their lottery was supposed to be used for education. I remember that. I remember them saying that, too. Yeah. And that's why they did it, but they don't seem to do it. And, you know, here they have, like old schools always have a tendency to get rebuilt with government money because, you know, they don't raise taxes on them. They just, they got the, they got the lottery money. And you have what's called splosh money here, S-P-L-O-S-T. And it's money that is set aside for the schools. And that's what you're supposed to use it for. Hmm. Well, I think Virginia needs to, yeah, Virginia Virginia. needs to go down there and study Georgia. They, they need to right. change it. And, then, and see, South Carolina is doing that now. And, you know, they get better. Uh, Florida's just got a house bill to pass uh, coach and supplement money to be paid by the hour that the coaches work. Yes. Wow. And that's up to a certain amount of money, and it's going to be a good chunk of change for them. They're pushing that. Uh, you know, and in retirement, I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't understand, you know, I was there in Virginia 24 years and I think my 
I was making $50,000 at Gretna was at the time I was there 10 years ago and 3,400 of it was my head coach himself. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We need to do something different. Yeah. I think it needs to be done. You gotta, you gotta get the coaches organized to where they are got to find somebody in Congress or whatever that will represent them and do it the right way. Uh, I just feel it's just terrible that coaches in Virginia are treated the way they are. I mean, you know, it's just they're, they're taking advantage of money wise. They're not paid for what they're doing. And then you get coaches in Virginia that are still got their jobs because nobody wants to run them off. I mean, you get under now down here. If you're an underperforming school, you know, this year we had 112 coaching openings. How many you got in Virginia? Nobody gets run off coaching. You can go and you can go on 50 and they'll keep you. <laughs> I mean, I hate to tell you the majority of places won't do nothing about it. So that's what, you know, is the difference there. Cause down here, they do understand that it, you do make money when you have a good athletic program and don't let them fool you. Education is still about making money. They, they mm. don't lie to you. They, I have always believed that, you know, it's about making money. Amen, coach. So is there anything else you'd like to say to the guys, coach? Everybody's always asking me about the wing T. Want me to um, get guys to come on and talk about the wing T. I know you you were a wing T guy, coach. Yeah, I, I truly think it's a good offense, but also think spread's a good offense. I want a state championship there at Gretna running the spread. Uh, yeah. Know, um, but they were running spread before I got there, and I was running wing T before I got there. And I tell you, I'm not stupid. I went in and kept doing what they were doing. I mean, you know, you get to, you get some of these guys, oh, we're going to change. We're going to do this because that's what I believe in. Well, I believe in winning, and winning is about putting kids in the right spot to win. Amen. And success doing that, and it's about the kids. It's not about me. It's not about the administration. It's only about those kids that are playing. And you, and as a job as a coach is put them in the best spot that they can be successful. And a job as a coach is to make them turn out to be productive citizens for the rest of their lives. Amen. Amen, coach. I got so much out of just listening to you speak and how, how much wisdom you have, you know, from being I, I so know. long. It's just called been around a long time. I don't think it's wisdom. I think it's thievery. I've stolen most of the stuff I got from a lot of coaches. I've just been around a while and paid attention to the really paid attention to the older coaches when they talk. When I first started, uh, you know, I was lucky to work with Coach Lindberg and, you know, got to go and see places and stuff and, and did a lot of things on my own. Uh, I would go spend time with other coaches and just go. We have guys that come in from New Jersey and places that come in down here and want to talk to us and, and about what we do and how we do things. And uh, it's just different. I mean, you get, I go, I went spent like two weeks ago at Walton high school um, myself, the head coach and another, and one of the other defensive coaches and just talk football with him over there during his planning period and stuff. And then, you know, I think you get a lot out of it. Uh, and I will tell you down here, there is one thing that's different. Kids down here have to pay to play. And it's one of the things that is different than anywhere I've been is, you know, you have to pay anywhere from 300 to $1,500 a kid. And it has to be paid for those kids to play because a lot of school systems down here won't give you the money for your football program. They will give you like, we'll pay for reconditioning and referees and the buses. The rest of it is on you as a school, as a, booster club to raise the money for the program mm. why some of the programs have a lot some of them don't yeah the rich get richer they do and it's happening down here and kids are going to kids leave and go to different schools all the time um, you know i'm not used to that but they do they just, they'll be at one place today and a different place tomorrow and it's you know it's that's going to happen eventually happen everywhere and because you know if you People are going to say, if I pay taxes, I'm going to send my kid to the school that I want them to go to. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to happen. You No doubt, Coach. Well, thank you for coming on again, Coach. We'll have you Love back it. on here soon. I'm going to press end.
We'll sit on here and chat for a second. All right. But thank you, Coach. Hey, thanks. Love it, Troy. Love you, brother. I'm impressed.